You're listening to Season 7 of Bionic Planet, brought to you by VERA, the world's most widely followed environmental standard, and by Responsible Alpha, a collaborative, high-impact ESG consultancy helping investors, businesses, and communities transition to a low-carbon, sustainable, and equitable future. I think the biggest challenge for the process overall is that both of these methodologies are incredibly complex, and so individual parts of it can be hard to digest, but also seeing how it all fits together and understanding what a project will look like under these methodologies was really hard for people to picture. Just over four years ago, Max Dubesson took on one of the most difficult challenges you can imagine, namely spearheading the creation of a new carbon methodology under both the Verified Carbon Standard and the Climate Action Reserve. Dubbed the methodology for improved agricultural land management, it aims to expand the practice of climate-smart agriculture by paying farmers who adopt the practices before their neighbors do. This is the story of the creation of that methodology. Man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. There's a group of us now who are proposing that the Earth has actually entered a new epoch, and that is the Anthropocene. Anthropocene. We know that the enemy is carbon, and we know it's ugly face, we should put a big fat price on it, and of course, add to that, drop the subsidies. Earth, we broke it, we own it, and nothing is as it was. Not the trees, not the seas, not the forests, farms, or fields, and not the global economy that depends on all of these. But we can restore it, make it better, greener, more resilient, more sustainable. But how? technology, geoengineering? Are we doomed to live on a bionic planet or is nature herself the answer? That's the question we address in every episode of Bionic Planet, a podcast of the Anthropocene, the new epoch defined by man's impact on Earth. And today we take you through one of the most misunderstood processes in meeting the climate challenge, namely the tedious process of developing a carbon methodology, which involves iterative rounds of expert review and public consultation. My guest is Max Dubesson of Indigo Ag. I caught up to him on Friday here at Yuran Climate Talks in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. The first time I heard of Indigo, I was at the mid-year talks in Bonn. A farmer came up to me and said, hey, this group is going to pay me $15 a ton for the cover crops I've been planting. And I was like, Fred, his name was Fred Yoder. I said, Fred, he can't... They can't pay you for what you're already doing. Um, and I was like, who are these guys? The Indigo kind of popped out of no place. And you had some really good ideas, but you seemed, from my perspective, to not have the methodology, but you had the intent. And then at some point in there, you guys shifted, you pivoted, and you developed a, a pretty good methodology that could be a game changer. Am I getting the sequence correct? I don't know what was happening inside Indigo. I know you guys from the outside. Yeah, I think that is correct. And I think around the time that you were talking to Fred, I was probably learning about Indigo myself. So I was still working at the Climate Action Reserve at that time. And Indigo had come to the reserve uh, around late 2018, I think, and then listed a nitrogen management project in early 2019. And it was really that year, 2019, where the scope of what Indigo wanted to accomplish really started to expand beyond just nitrogen management and include soil carbon. And there was also a recognition of the need to work with registries, the need to develop new standards. When I was at the reserve, probably late 2019, September of that year, I did a soil carbon workshop at the AIDA North American Carbon Summit in New York during Climate Week. And so Indigo was one of the groups that I invited because a lot of groups were coming to me at the registry and saying, well, you need to do cropland management with soil carbon. You need to take another look at this. It's something the reserve had taken a look at several years earlier, probably 2011, and moved away from. So when I saw Indigo and learned more about what they were doing, I said, they've really thought through this science. They've really brought on a lot of scientific firepower and agronomic firepower. And so I kind of 
caught them right in the middle of that transition from big ideas to really making it work in the carbon market. That's interesting. So you were already inside the Climate Action Reserve, so you already had expertise. I think I heard about it, I think it was 2016, somewhere between 2016 and 2018, that I was looking at their site and they're hiring people with really good backgrounds. These guys are serious. What was it about them that impressed you? You mentioned that they had the science right. Can you be a little more specific? Sure. So I started personally working in ag carbon maybe around 2012, 2013, engaging a lot in the Coalition on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases. And we went through several years of a lot of fits and starts at the reserve and at other registries and standards organizations developing things like the nitrogen management protocol and rice cultivation protocols. And we saw a lot of good people put a lot of effort into protocols that didn't generate a lot of credits. And I saw a lot of these pilot projects where you had to bring together four or five different organizations. You'd have a consultant, you'd have a government agency, there's maybe a grant and a university and a project developer. And so it was unwieldy and took a long time and was small scale usually and Mm -hmm. didn't result in a lot of credits. And so I think the difference for me when I saw Indigo was that they had brought all of those capabilities under one roof and they were willing to put a lot of resources behind it to do it quickly and to try and do it with integrity, but to try and go right to scale, not do a small pilot project. And I can say now that we've gone through a couple of years of our own project at Indigo, there are things that would have been easier if we'd tried it at a pilot scale, Uh but it wouldn't have worked. We wouldn't be where we are if we hadn't just gone straight to the large scale, because there are certain things in ag that really only work at large scale. Yeah. A brief segue before I get into my next question. I just hope listeners will take the time after this to go into the public consultations that came when you guys were developing that methodology, the public mm-hmm. consultations on the Vero website, because I just found them incredibly insightful. And what triggered that in my mind was you had talked about seeing projects that were really good that didn't get a lot of attention. One of the interesting debates that emerged in the public consultation was this question of how do you find that sweet spot? If you make something that's you could say it's perfect, the perfect being the enemy of the good. If you're too tight, you're too... And it, it was in the additionality argument, which I think we'll get to in a bit, but so many people were saying, if you go this route, if you go with this extreme high additionality, you're never going to get any projects. It's never going to get done. Mm-hmm. And the debate, which I hope we have time to get into, shifted into the way change is implemented in agriculture. So I think we'll loop back to that in a bit. But why don't we go back to where I diverged? Because I think it's interesting if we could talk about the process of developing a methodology, because that's what you had that knowledge already from CAR. And then when you came with Indigo, they decided they wanted to take this methodology that they were working on and get it approved by a standard. And they Mm -hmm. ended up with Vera. Maybe you can talk about why they chose to go with Vera. There's a difference or it was just one turn left instead of right. Yeah. So in fact, we did two. And I think that was a really important part of the process. So when I came, I left the reserve at the end of 2019 and joined Indigo in early 2020. They had already been in talks with both registries and they had already been in talks with a consultant, Terra Carbon, to start coming up with putting these ideas down into concrete protocol text. You've read these methodologies. They're <laughs> dense and specialized. So that's where I came in is that Terra Carbon was already starting to draft. And so by engaging with both of the standards orgs at the same time, it really enabled a lot more to happen a lot faster because it engaged so many expert stakeholders and plenty of stakeholders were engaged with both processes, but it meant that ideas could flow more quickly and in some cases bounce back and forth between the two. In the case of Vera, we were also going through an external methodology validation with Mm -hmm. Aster Global. With Vera, you send them a concept note first. You say, this is what we're planning to do. If they approve that, then you send them a draft of the methodology. And so we submitted the rough draft to Vera. That kicks off the validation process and also Vera's own staff review. So we were the first methodology to go through their kind of new process of doing staff review instead of double validation. Can you explain that a bit? Sure. In the double validation process that the way it used to work with Vera, you would hire two independent validation bodies, provide them with your draft methodology, and then you would get lists of findings from both and you'd have to satisfy both and then you make it into the public comment period. And they've now moved to you hire one independent validator and then the Vera staff conduct the second validation. And so the nice thing here is you're getting a lot more direct feedback from the standards body during the process. And also the Vera staff then are experts in that methodology themselves when it gets Mm -hmm. to the end of the process. So it was new. Both sides were figuring it out as we went. I think we went through two rounds of public comment for that one. And then at the same time, we provided the same drafts to the Climate Action Reserve. Their process is a bit different. They own the process. They took those early drafts and then developed their own protocol along with it. And obviously both organizations have different templates, so they end up just in different formats. So there's a lot of language that is similar, 
their staff formed an expert stakeholder working group. So Indigo was one member of the working group and we participated along with other expert stakeholders. There's a lot of language that's different, but at the core, the ideas were the same in both of those protocols. We pursued to, partly because the two standards have different scopes geographically, but they also have different approaches to things. And we thought it was gonna have a higher opportunity of a sort of workable, rigorous protocol by going through both at the same time. And now we're planning and are implementing both. That's interesting. So I see what you mean now about how you get more eyes on it. Are there any concrete examples of how one process informed the other? There were examples. When a significant change would happen with one, we would make sure to tell the other one about it as soon as we could. There's not only the protocols themselves, but there's also a separate modeling guidance document. So with Vera, it's a module called VMD53, and with the Reserve, it's just a standalone model guidance document. Those are ones where we tried to keep them both informed so that they would stay as close together as possible, so that anybody who was doing any project like this was held to the highest standards. Jargon alert. We're about to skip over one of the most complicated and contentious chapters of the Carbon Market Training Manual, namely the one on additionality, which is how you determine the degree to which carbon markets cause an activity to take place. Without getting too deep into the weeds, one way is to demonstrate financial additionality, which means showing you couldn't afford to make the change without the carbon finance. Another is to implement what's called a common practices test. Max is about to explain both of these again, but I wanted to throw the ideas out to you so they don't catch you cold. Now, up until a few years ago, I was adamantly opposed to any additionality test that didn't involve financial additionality. And, as we'll see in a bit, the public consultation around this specific methodology is what changed my mind. You can find that consultation in today's show notes or by Googling Vera Indigo Public Consultation. If you do that, I invite you to look at comment number three, which references a 2014 paper called Explaining the Economic Irrationality, that's irrationality in quotes, of farmers' land use behavior. The paper crystallizes something I've seen in rural communities around the world from Kenya to the United States. Namely, farmers are reluctant to implement new practices unless their neighbors go first for a variety of reasons that are very logical but not readily apparent. That matters here because climate smart agriculture should, over time, pay for itself by increasing yields and decreasing costs. As we saw way back in episode 7 of Bionic Planet, that was in 2016, called Of Milk and Money, and again in episode 39. That was in 2018. It was called How the World's Farmers Are Engaging the Global Climate Apparatus. If climate-smart agriculture pays for itself in the long term, shouldn't that support the financial additionality argument? I used to think so, but research shows that's not the case. And comment three summarizes the research thus. Growers do not act purely in pursuit of long-term profit maximization, even if that is how it appears. Growers also consider factors such as maximizing social value, adhering to in-group norms and values, and simplifying the decision-making process through heuristics. I can go into more detail on that, but that would be a different show. This episode isn't about the merits of financial additionality versus common practice tests. It's about the process of creating a new carbon methodology. And I rudely interrupted Max after asking him to explain how this methodology benefited from being developed under two different standards, specifically where divergent views led to a better approach overall. When we get into additionality, I'd say that's one place where they ended up diverging in the way that they did things in interesting ways. Was that because of the issues that were raised in the public consultation, or was there a different reason for that? In the early drafts, there wasn't a test for common practice. So there Mm -hmm. wasn't this assessment of common practice that had to be done. Before you guys came along, before I read the public consultations, I was really adamant about the need for financial additionality. Mm -hmm. I was um, highly skeptical of the common practice additionality test. And it was in reading the public comments and some of the papers that were cited that I was like, oh, now I get it. Yeah. You probably explain it better than I can. What is additionality? What is a common practice additionality test? And how does it differ? And how did you end up in that? So when we think about additionality, we're thinking about doing something new that's above and beyond what would have happened otherwise. And there's kind of direct methods to that, the sort of assessment of barriers, and then 
rationale for how you're overcoming that barrier. So a financial additionality test would be an example of that. There's a financial barrier, and here is how we're overcoming this financial barrier. You mean it's not going to pay for itself? It's not going to pay for itself. And in some ways, you can combine it with a sort of sector-wide financial additionality kind of thing, but it's still not a like spreadsheet of costs and benefits for a particular right. project. Then there are indirect methods that are more trying to test out proxies. And this is something that the Climate Action Reserve uses a lot because of their much more standardized approach to methodologies where you're trying to assess an entire sector up front. You're not trying to assess individual projects, but you're trying to say for this sector, this is what is additional. And so that's where common practice is often a much more useful tool. Say, for example, with anaerobic digestion of dairy manure, you would look at all of the dairies in a certain country and you would look at how many of them use anaerobic digestion to manage their manure. And you'd say, is this common or not? And common then has to be defined. In many cases, 5% is used as a threshold for common practice. There's a lot of people that would debate whether that's a good place to put it, whether it's even at all reasonable. And so that's the downside for common practice tests is they're very blunt and they're very one size fits all. And it's a very sort of industrial kind of mindset that everybody in this sector is the same and they're all facing the same pressures and costs. And so if 5% or more are doing this thing, then everybody should be able to do it. And that's just really not the case with agriculture. We put a lot of thought into this, and I think the Appendix A of the Soil Enrichment Protocol with the Climate Action Reserve has a really good in-depth discussion about farmers and how they're not necessarily what you'd consider a rational economic actor. They've got very different pressures on them. They've got a lot of social and cultural pressures on them, and they're viewing decisions in a very different lens than, say, somebody determining whether or not to put in pollution control device at a factory. Yeah, I didn't read that appendix, but I did read the Vera public consultation, and I found the same thing. There were papers cited on what drives change in the agriculture sector, and one thing, and I found this too, just dealing with farmers in Kenya and elsewhere, you might have a practice like putting in switchgrass or cover crops or something that you can show over the long haul will probably pay for itself, but farmers don't want to change anything until they see their neighbors doing it. Right. And getting to that point is is critical, and that's why the common practice approach says, okay, if you're in an area where only 1% of the people are doing this, and if you do it before it gets up to 5%, you can get a payment because you are taking a risk because it might not work. And it was interesting to see the research on that laid out. And then, again, that is why you have public consultation because then you get more minds on it because it is subjective in the end, and there's always going to be debate. And the idea is to find that sweet spot where most experts agree. Yeah, and I think project developers can make you a spreadsheet that shows what you want to see. Some people cling to the idea of a financial additionality test being objective, but it's only as objective as the numbers that are put forward, which it's itself a very subjective exercise. And so can you trust it? I don't know. I think no-till farming is a good example where some people would say no-till makes sense. You spend a lot less money on fuel, you're spending less time, like this is going to pay for itself. But I think it was maybe in Gabe Brown's book, Dirt to Soil, that he was telling a story about talking to a farmer who was doing no-till and had taken years of grief from his mother-in-law who (laughs) accused him of being lazy. (laughs) (laughs) You're just a lazy farmer because you're not willing to go out and till your field. And Uh he tried to explain, no, this is the benefits of this thing I'm doing. And his neighbors are looking over like, your field is messy. Yeah. So (laughs) it's things like this that in some places it takes a lot for a farmer to overcome that. Yeah. I mentioned Fred Yoder at the start. He's a character and he's been pushing his neighbors to do Mm no-till. And I heard he had a neighbor who he called him full-till bill or something, just rode (laughs) the guy for years and years. And then he became no-till bill when he switched over. But it is hard to get people to make those changes. Exactly. So as part of VM42, the VERA methodology, the first step in that additionality test is doing a social and cultural barriers analysis. So individual projects will be submitting sort of similar analysis for their project. And then the next step is that common practice assessment. Let's go back a little into the process. And you can talk about both methodologies or or one if it's easier. I know in VERA you, you submitted the methodology, it went through the VVB, the external review, then the internal review, then it went out for public consultation. What were the biggest challenges you faced in that first round and any surprises when you got to the public consultation that forced the second one? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge for the process overall is that both of these methodologies are incredibly complex. And so individual parts of it can be hard to digest, but also seeing how it all fits together and understanding what a project will look like under these methodologies was really hard for people to picture. I think there was a sort of constant education component of explaining to people, even people 
in the expert working groups, and Vera has their own agricultural land management mm -hmm. advisory group, so they were also part of assisting the Vera staff with their review, so we had to answer some questions from them to help them understand. I think that was a constant challenge. Some of the statistical components and the modeling components are new, they're dense. I have the pleasure of having a data science team <laughs> that can <laughs> explain these things to me. But even myself, I've written two dozen protocols in the past, a lot of it was Greek to me. So I think that was the biggest challenge. So doing something like that at the pace that we did it. Both of these were done within 10 months. And that's still so long. It's fast by the standards of this world. And that's what I also find a little frustrating as I talk to people who think they don't realize how much work goes into creating a methodology. Right. A lot of people think Vera or CAR there's a couple people in a room who sit down and pop it out. Right. And what I find really infuriating is a lot of the people making those accusations are a couple of people sitting in a room popping stuff out. Yeah. Um, and these experts, they have full-time jobs, yeah. right? This is not their full-time job. And so to them, sometimes it felt quick because if they were given two weeks or three weeks to read something, it felt like only a couple of days because they were busy for the first couple of weeks. And I fully understand that. I fully understand that because I'm in the same boat, putting these shows together part-time while deep-pocketed competitors start with $15,000 per episode. I do have support from Vera and Responsible Alpha, and that's made it possible for me to bring in a part-time producer, but I need your help to generate even more and better episodes. So if you like what you hear and you want more and better episodes, then help me deliver them by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash bionic planet. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Bionic Planet, Bionic Planet, all one word. There are no dots or dashes. There you can support the show for as little as a buck an episode, but with a monthly cap. This way, if you think $5 per month is a good amount, you can make that both your per episode amount and your monthly cap. Or you can just go with the minimum, since I rarely do more than five per month anyway. The address again is patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Bionic Planet. You can also help by giving me a five-star review on whichever podcatcher you access me through. That helps because the more stars I get, the more ears I get. And the more ears I get, the more minds I can reach. And we have to reach hundreds of millions of minds if we're to meet the climate challenge. We can do it if we all work together. And now, back to the show. Do you remember what were the biggest things that you had to change over the course of the process to get through it? The most significant change was that neither one included a common practice assessment at the start. In the case of the Climate Action Reserve Protocol, there was development of a lot more guidance because mm -hmm. their protocols tend to be more prescriptive. So VM42 just completely has less text yeah, <laughs> in yeah. it. And so getting into some of the details of really explaining baselines and the data collection and sampling procedures, those were things that took a lot of work during mm -hmm. the process. And a few other things I think that changed along the way, perhaps the approach to leakage was something that took a fair bit of development along the way, but I think came out in a good place. Can you explain that, what leakage is and how would it apply here? Because I can understand leakage in most other contexts. But. Sure. So leakage occurs when the project activity, while reducing emissions within the project and the project area, mm -hmm. causes an increase in emissions outside the project area. Mm -hmm. And the way that happens in these agricultural projects, there's two sources of leakage that we're concerned about. The first is displacement of livestock. So if there okay. was grazing right. on the cropland or rangeland, so either of those are eligible, if those animals aren't grazed in the project scenario, you have to assume that they're grazing somewhere else. And so you account for those emissions. You don't get credit for just moving the enteric emissions out of the project area. That one's actually the most straightforward. And then the other would be yield decline. So if some of these practices, there's concern that at least for some period of time, there's what they call yield drag. If you reduce your fertilizer application, there's a risk that you'll produce less biomass in your crop and produce commercial crop at the end. And the idea is the food system needs that crop. So somebody else has to grow it somewhere else. And so in both of the methodologies, there is some version of monitoring yield and at some point accounting for leakage related to that yield decline. It's done in different ways in both of them, but that's the core idea. Okay. And in the long term, once the, the field kind of recovers or adapts to the new approaches, yields should increase or return to normal. They should. Now that timeline is going to be different for every field. It's going to depend on the practice and the rotation. Most of these farmers are growing in rotation. I think that's one of the harder things for a lot of folks who haven't dealt with ag carbon to really get their head around is the project, it looks different every year at the field level. Yeah. 
growers are changing their crops, in some cases, that's what we're encouraging them to do to store more carbon. If they're growing just a corn monocrop, we're going to want them to start to rotate that with soybeans or something so that you can get not only potentially legumes into the mix to put nitrogen into the soil, but also keep a living root in the soil longer during the year. So you've got weather that's changing and all of that. It's a good opportunity to segue into what it is we're talking about. We've talked about the challenge of creating a methodology, but we haven't talked about what the methodology does. Can you maybe just summarize this for it? Like what kind of activities do you encourage and then how are credits generated from that? Sure. So I mentioned earlier that previous agricultural protocols tend to be very narrow in scope, like just nitrogen management, which was just a fertilizer reduction on certain crop in a certain place. These methodologies are much more broad. So there's no specification of which crops are eligible. It is just land use categories. So pasture land and crop land. So actively managed agricultural land. And then there are also just categories of practices, highly detailed practices. It's buckets like tillage, changes to tillage management, crop rotations, crop harvesting, planting, irrigation, livestock management, nutrient management, all of those things are buckets. And so when the growers sign up in our project, we don't tell them exactly what they have to do. What we do is we provide them with a carbon calculator that says, here's a variety of things you can do. Tell us about your farm. We'll tell you what we think will be most impactful for you. And we'll give you some advice Mm -hmm. to do it well. And they can stack practices. They could do all of these things. Most of them are going to try one thing. Is there one that's most common? The biggest categories would be tillage reduction or or avoidance, cover crops, and nitrogen management. Can you explain all three briefly? Yeah, sure. So tillage is essentially soil disturbance. So often that happens prior to planting. You use, in a lot of cases, the tillage is used to kill the weeds that grew up after the last crop. And in the process of doing that, you're digging up the soil and it all... Yes. You're disturbing the soil. You're allowing the carbon that's locked underground to be exposed to the air and to oxidize and go off as CO2. And so if you stop doing tillage, you can keep that carbon in the soil. Then you have to do something else to manage those weeds. Cover crops would be to have something living and growing in the ground when otherwise you wouldn't. So a lot of times in certain areas, you've got your cash crop that you plant in the spring, you harvest in the fall, and then the field is fallow until the next spring. So the idea is you then get a cover crop in, and usually there's enough time for that crop to grow up into something before winter comes and then it usually grows a bit more before the spring planting comes and then you terminate the crop and plant again and it's like a switch grass or something like that yeah it again it's different in different regions and so we have one of the tools that we've built is a cover crop decision tool that helps growers in different places understand and in a lot of cases it's a blend so you're looking for a blend of crops where you might have a legume in there to put some nitrogen in. You might want a crop that has a deep root. You might want one that has some lateral roots. You want different structures. You can think of it almost like a healthy forest, a good field of cover crops. And the way we think about it is photosynthesis is our technology. That's our carbon capture technology. It's proven. And if we can get more photosynthesis happening, you can think of a fallow field as like shutting down the factory for three or four months of the year. So if we can get a cover crop, then we can keep the factory open, but at a low rate. Okay, that's a good analogy. And then nutrient management, fertilizer management, especially in the US, the growers who are applying fertilizer at some form of nitrogen, and depending on what form it is, when you apply it, how you apply it, there's always some level of nitrous oxide emissions. And nitrous oxide is an especially nasty greenhouse gas. Uh, It's about 265 times as potent as CO2. And so, We call it nutrient management rather than just fertilizer reduction because in some cases what you're changing is the timing of the application or the form of the application. Maybe you inject it underground or put it in your irrigation water. So there's different ways of doing that. But that's the idea is you're avoiding nitrous oxide emissions. But you have to be very careful with what you change and how you change it because the plants need the nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So what you're really trying to do is reduce any of that nitrogen that wasn't being used by the plant. The stuff that was going in the air need to increase that nitrogen use efficiency. Right. Okay, so what are the carbon payments based on? So we made sure to design this as a pay-for-performance program rather than a pay-for-practice program. Government programs are a great example of pay-for-practice. So the federal government, through the Farm Bill in the U.S., often has funding for different types of practices, and they've got the NRCS has practice standards, and it's like a checkoff. I did the thing, you send me a check, and we're good. Nobody's checking to see how well you did it, what the results were, (laughs) are the outcomes durable. So pay for performance is we will quantify the actual emission reductions and removals that are happening on your field in a certain year, 
and we'll pay you in the metric of tons of CO2 equivalent. So the contracts that the growers have says they'll get 75% of whatever we're able to sell their credits for that are generated on their field. So a certain number of credits don't get sold. They go into a buffer pool for maintaining permanence, but the credits that are sold, at least 75% of that revenue goes back to the growers. And what they love about that is that they get to share in the upside if we can push carbon prices higher. And that's what we've been trying to do. After this was recognized under Vera, there was a revision. As I understood, it was to make it more broadly applicable. Is that correct? Or what was that about? It's actually still under revision now. We anticipate that version two is going to be released fairly soon. And I think that that just highlights like this is a natural part of the process. So these methodologies are living documents. In all my experience with protocols, we rarely stuck with version one for very long. And in some cases, we never registered a project under version one. Updated as we learned from the projects that we're trying to go through. Both of the standards bodies have updated their methodologies. So the soil enrichment protocol was updated to version 1.1 during our first verification. So we were actually verified under 1.1. And yeah, Vera is doing a 2.0. It's partly based on things that we've learned in trying to implement it. And it's partly based on a lot of questions and feedback that they've received from other people trying to implement it. I think there's about 35 different projects now wow. listed under VM42 all around the world. Where do we go from here? Like, How big... So we've brought the U.S. project to a very large scale. We've got several million acres under contract. Hundreds of thousands of those acres have already gone into verification. We're halfway through the second verification, and we'll be doing data collection this winter for our third verification to happen next year. So that one's rolling along and expanding it. We'll be continuing to expand the scope of that. We're continuing to do some research trials to expand our grazing data, for example, so that we can do more modeling of grazing. And then expanding internationally. As I said, there's uh, a few dozen projects now listed under VM42. We have one of them in Europe, and so we're working with partners around the world to start to implement VM42. So I think we're going to continue to see people trying things out. We're going to continue to see both of the standards bodies learning and changing and seeing what works here. I think we're also in a really interesting time with this new greenhouse gas protocol guidance and a lot of conversations about how does this world fit in with the supply chain accounting world. Because with agriculture specifically, we're part of this food, fuel, fiber supply chains, and those companies are really interested in accounting for those emission reductions and removals in a different way. And we're an active participant in seeing how these two worlds fit together. That was going to be my, my last question is, how do you see this fitting into the whole supply chain movement? And also, do you think your buyers will be more people in the agriculture sector already, as opposed to, say, factories and mm -hmm. something more industrial? One thing that we're very lucky about is there's no shortage of demand for these credits. So even in our first rounds of sales, there was far more interest than there were credits. So we were a bit choosy and we did smaller deals. So we had all the buyers lined up for that first issuance and for the next issuance. And they are a mix. Some of them do have ag supply chains. They're not using these credits as inventory reductions. They are using them as offsets, but they are interested in that story and connecting these credits to their supply chain. So Maple Leaf Foods, Blue Bottle Coffee, New Belgium Brewing, and then we've got plenty of buyers who don't have ag supply chains. Barclays Bank, J.P. Morgan, Boston Consulting Group, who are just interested in high-quality credits that have a good story and a tied to the land in some way in people's lives. So we're seeing massive demand for them simply as credits, and we're seeing massive demand for these reductions as supply chain reductions. And I think that's a good thing because right now the world of supply chain reductions is in the world of sustainability folks and marketing folks. And when those costs move over to the procurement folks, they're going to want to eliminate those costs. <laughs> and that means the farmers won't get paid to make these changes and mm -hmm. to do the hard work that's going to be asked of them. And so having this huge source of demand from the voluntary credit buyers is helpful in that there's a bit of a competition for these claims. So we're going to need to continue to incentivize the farmers. Yeah, that brings up uh, another episode we'll be doing on Scope 3 emissions and accounting, which is a huge... Yeah, is that an, an eight-parter? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Is there anything I missed? Anything you want to make sure we cover while I've got you here? For us, the key to all of this is the land and the manager of the land. And so this is something, especially in the supply chain accounting world, that we're really having to educate outward and educate to the standards bodies that you can't just see this as sort of what happened in this year and then you walk away. Somebody needs to stay with this land to monitor these changes and to be able to help the farmer through all the variation in their farm over time and to keep that farm on this trajectory and to make sure that the standards that are creating those incentives and enabling those claims work for that scenario. 
Max Vasson of Indigo Ag closing out this edition of Bionic Planet, coming to you this week from year-end climate talks in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. This episode was produced by Deborah Friedman, whose sultry voice opened the show, with funding from Standard Setting Body Vera and ESG consultancy Responsible Alpha. If you like what you hear and you want more and better episodes, then help me deliver them by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash bionic planet. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash bionic planet, bionic planet, no dots or dashes. There you can support the show for as little as a buck an episode, but with a monthly cap. That wraps up today's show. Until next time, I'm Steve Zwick in Charmel Sheik. Thanks for listening. Bionic Planet.